soon you won't have to show that to anyone. <laughs> In the event that you have one of these lovely devices that you would be so fond of to put it in your pocket, and I have a story about that that I like to tell you. It's not favorite, I would tell you. There's somebody that had this chicken and it went off over there. How many of you live in student housing? And you know, I will be honest with you back. I thought that students in housing were doing something really bad with the chicken because it was making lots of noise. But they got up and they were talking on the phone and watching the ducks. No problem. I'm in a lecture. It's all good. Nobody cares. <laughs> Those of you in my class know that usually I have all kinds of things I can say for ducks and phones. Because I always forget things. If you haven't had enough science at the end of the evening, if you have a slot in your schedule tomorrow, uh, there's some posters out there. There's a talk in here as well, also at 7 o'clock. Uh, Oregon, uh, from Oregon to orbit, inside Oregon, the first satellite. So my colleague Aaron Coiner uh, has started having posting a variety of physics and astronomy lectures. This is another in that group. So Feel free to stop back tomorrow. Talk to Aaron afterwards as well. He's got a couple of extra posters for you to also. Uh, it's really my pleasure this evening to introduce another in a long stream of Iris FSA distinguished speakers. Uh, Iris FSA has worked for many years in sending folks that are in the seismic field around the country to give talks to disseminate information about seismology specific research to top-notch scientists. And so for those of you that have gotten used to putting a few bucks in the in the jar, greatly appreciate it because it's the folks that are here that support it, the sponsors, as well as groups like Iris FSA that actually uh, fund Dr. Simon's travel from the East Coast out to here. Uh, he also has given a total of seven talks as part of this program, getting ready for an eighth as well that they just added closer to, closer to home. Uh, we talked over dinner that the irony is that two of the seven are actually in Oregon. So he started, he did a talk up at Omni in Portland. Yesterday he did a talk up in Newport at the Hatfield Institute, and today down, down here. I'm a little used to this today with Iris, where it's in the last two years Tuesday in, in Omni, but it's nice to see uh, that they're supporting science all around, uh, all around Oregon. Those of you that came in early, you might have noticed some posters. Uh, the next talk is the annual Cascadia talk, so a little bit of seismic tonight, a little bit of earthquake and seismic at the end of January. If you got any place to post these, I know it's a little bit early because the talk's not till the end of January, so please feel free to take some with you and put them around the, around the different communities and different places. And also, if you didn't sign in, if you take a minute on the way out, groups like IRIS to send people around, one of the things that they request is that you don't necessarily guarantee, but that you strive for having at least 200 people in the audience. So having an actual number helps me with that as well. So one more plug for January. If you're interested in those old fashioned things called books, uh, Dr. Jones wrote a book recently. It's called The Big One. It's about natural disasters, including earthquakes. Uh, we'll have a number of copies of that available for sale as part of a fundraiser to fund the series. Uh, and if you would be so kind, they'll go for $25. You are welcome to pay more. Uh, I can't ask you to, but you're more than welcome to. Uh, but if you have the opportunity and, and the interest in that, if you could bring cash or a check, that would be fantastic. Then we don't have to pay additional, additional charges. And now, you don't want to hear more about Dr. Simon, and one of the funny things, I studied an esoteric field as a graduate student called the Kronenbaum, and we were chatting riding around town this afternoon, and it turns out he had a paleontology instructor who I knew as a Kronenbaum researcher back in the olden golden days of my school, and that was like one of the best professors ever, except for you, of course. Got into the small world comments. So, uh, Dr. Simon started.
dadurch wird der Gesetze unglaublich schwierig. Dadurch geht es hier der Mann in eine mehr der Prinzen in der Rüstung. Und es ist mein Great Pleasure, zu introducen you, Trevor Simon. All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Metzger. It was very nice to be here. And yes, it's the third talk in Oregon, but what can I say? I like it here. It's really beautiful. Uh, Portland is uh, weird, as you probably know. Um, I like the pu public transportation there very much. It reminds me of the old world where we ride in trains and trams. So anyway, it's not about you, it's about the earth, right? So um, I'm going to uh, tell you today about um, how we are looking inside the earth, why we are doing that, and what our uh, latest uh, instrumentation is to be able to do so even better than before. Um, I uh, thank myself, the IRIS and the SSA for uh, sending me here. IRIS is an academic organization of, uh, it's a consortium of universities that gets together and says whatever seismic data that we collect, we share with each other and with the world. All the instruments that are pr providing data, everything we know about the Alaskan earthquake from today and you know, no doubt tomorrow, all of that data sort of streams into the Seattle Data Management Center from which you now can go online and get it and look at it and they make animations, they make uh, movies, they make uh, maps, they do analysis and so all of that data is out there shared and uh, archived and curated by IRIS and that's just one of the many things that they do for the academic community. And then the Seismological Society of America is, is what the name implies. It's a group of people who get together regularly to discuss uh, seismology, and they, of course, are equally interested in, in outreach and in uh, also them in the engineering aspects of keeping us safe from uh, earthquakes. So um, it, it's a relatively large audience. Um, so I can't be very interactive, but I'm going to have one question. If anyone knows which island this is, I'll give them a point for, an extra point for attendance. Anyone recognize this, this, uh, this island? Where? No. Okay, so this is the, I'll, I'll uh, it's roughly around here. Does that help? Okay. <clears throat> so that, if I zoom in here, we're getting into French Polynesia. And we're seeing, it's a little fuzzy here. There is the main island of Tahiti appearing. Papete is the capital. And that island to the west of it is called Moria. And that is that island. Okay. Now, I do like to uh, dwell a little bit on the picture like this here. This is just a random snapshot of the ocean floor. And you can all go do it on Google Earth. And I really do love to stare at the floor of the ocean because it's showing so many features that are intriguing. These are clearly a whole bunch of volcanoes, some of them extinct, some of them active. There are ridges, there are lines, they're all faults. There are places that we know not well enough, which we can also see with our naked eye that, the, that there's sort of mismatches in resolution here and there. And uh, why are these things there? How are they fed? Where does the material come from? That's sort of one of those first order questions. And if I sort of jump ahead to one of the possible interpretations and answers that you will find in sort of standard textbook material, it is that islands like this, like Hawaii, like Tahiti, like Moria next to it, Samoa, um, Azores, are volcanoes that in a cartoon interpretation are fed by material that comes from the deep earth. And the deep earth here, this layer, if you will, that's of course called the earth's mantle, the Earth's crust is the very thin veneer of stuff that's on the top here. And the Earth's core, as you should all know, is, is made of not rock but, but, but iron, okay? Um, other baselining here, whatever is in the Earth's mantle, while we think that it is moving, it is part of a convective system where heat gets redistributed by material moving and by heat um, conducting and radiation and convection, um, None of the Earth's mantle, of course, is liquid. Do not make that mistake that the textbooks often made to paint this in very vivid, fiery colors and, you know, pretending like it's all lava down there. The Earth's mantle is a solid that nevertheless, over the long time scales that we have in geology, is moving ever so slowly around 
plastically over time scales of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of years. And so there are pieces of the Earth that are part of large-scale convective upwellings. And this is one of those areas where we're thinking that material must be coming up because, after all, we have these volcanoes. By the time that material is near the surface, that's when the pressure drops and the excess temperature that that material has is then liquefying the rock, and that's when you get lavas and magmas, uh, uh, well, lavas coming out of the volcanoes. So this sort of picture that you get on the right here in a, in a typical textbook is based on uh, uh, an analysis that I'll give you a lot more detail about. So the picture on the left there is somebody else's seismic interpretation. It's based on a model, and I'll show you how it gets made, where the, the reds are... Um, Warm, the warm colors indicate that the, the speeds of seismic waves are slower than average, and the blues that suggest colder, uh, the colder colors, I'm not going to uh, jump the gun here, are areas where the seismic waves, so the waves generated by earthquakes, are moving faster than average from source to receiver. And um, the color scale of blue and red, which is reminiscent of the hot and cold water on your uh, faucets here, is because to first order, the things that make seismic waves move faster than normal is when the material through which they pass is colder than average. And the, uh, when rocks have an excess temperature, when they're hotter, they will slow down the seismic waves. So it's pictures like this, and this is an analysis from somebody else, and I'll get to it, that show these big red blobs under Tahiti and in other areas, but I'm zooming in here on, on Tahiti, that are then interpreted as part of material that because it is slowing the speed of seismic waves down, it must be hotter than average. If it's hotter than average, it's less dense than the average, and if it's less dense than the average, it must be coming up because there is uh, Archimedes' law that will tell you that what is less dense will rise. So these are cartoons. These are images that are now 20, 25 years old, and none of that is enough detail for us. And if you want to walk away with one reason of why we went to Tahiti and why we're in the ocean recording seismic waves, it's because we want to know what exactly is going on underneath those islands, of which there are hundreds, but the very special ones are, are in French Polynesia here, where uh, we are really trying to refine what's going on under there. Okay. Um, uh, this is an audience, of course, where you would all know where uh, Hawaii is, and Hawaii is the canonical example of another such island that we would be equally interested in, and that no doubt we're going to go to with a similar experiment at some other time. Here it is, and um, I, again, like to look just at the shape of the ocean floor here. You're seeing that Hawaii is today's location of a volcano, and yesterday's location of these volcanoes and, 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 and over the last several million years it has sh uh, made this whole trail of d extinct volcanoes because whatever hot material is rising up at the surface is piercing the tectonic plate, that is the ocean uh, plate that you see here, and as that plate is moving around, which is the motion of plates called, uh, well, that's what fits in the large theory of plate tectonics, we are seeing these plates move. Uh, the interpretation is that being fed by such a plume of hot material that's rising up, well, as the plate moves this way, the trail of volcanoes goes the other way, and it gives us the speed of the plates, and it gives us the time of these uh, volcanic plumes. So here is that in, an, in another cartoon. Here would be Hawaii, right there. And so some source of buoyant, hotter-than-average upwelling material is feeding these volcanoes, and as the plate moves to the west, in the northwest in this picture, it is carrying volcanoes up, and they then go extinct because they're no longer being fed by this mantle plume. But now here, this is, again, a textbook cartoon, and I want to, what the first thing I then see in pictures of, of it like this is, is the question mark. Okay, so mantle plume, question mark. Does that even exist? This is a theory. We have evidence that we're building the evidence for it that it may exist. This thing here is the giveaway also. It's not to scale. We do not know exactly how deep these plumes are going. We think they are there. It makes sense that they're there. We have, we're accumulating the evidence, 
but we really don't know very well how deep those things go. We don't know very well how wide they are. We don't know very well how fast they move. We don't know very well how much material they bring up. And all of the details of the large-scale circulation of the Earth's mantle is part of what we are trying to figure out and get more and more detail uh, about. So if I move into an extremely academic text-based uh, slide here for a minute here, it's about our Earth, which is a geological terrestrial, as the name implies, body, which is a differentiated thing in the solar system that has a crust, a mantle, and a, and a, and a core. And those, that, those are the large-scale uh, structures. Um, what we really want to know is what the three-dimensional details of that are. What are the differences in material, and what are the differences in temperature on the inside of our Earth, which is only one of the planets we're interested in. Uh, you've probably all heard about the seismometer landing on Mars. That's the first one of them, and it's, tr it's looking for the same types of answers on the interior structure of Mars. We've been to the moon with seismometers. No doubt we'll go to other planets in your lifetime if we are so lucky. And it's all because a seismic wave, an elastic mechanical wave generated by an earthquake, it is sensitive to the types of material it goes through. I'm going to take a slight detour and also tell you a very little bit about the Earth's gravity field, which I think is just interesting, and it's another one of my academic interests. Um, and I'm going to tell you a very little bit about that thing that I think we should all love staring at, which is the Earth's topography, just the shape of it, because it's a window into, the, into its interior. I'm going to skip over this and go back to topography here. A map of the Earth, the height of the mountains, the depth of the oceans. It's the first evidence that we have of what the material is doing. Um, I don't see the pointer myself here, but if I say that we're looking at, let's, let's say, Tibet, we know the Tibetan Plateau is high. If you're looking at the ocean floor, you're seeing these, these lighter colors. Now I'm tracking that. Uh, you're seeing mid-ocean ridges, which are zones where the ocean floor is being created. You're seeing deep ocean trenches where, by inference, the ocean floor is being destroyed. And so all the ups and downs of the Earth's topography have some sort of a signature of what's happening to it, how it's deforming, how it is um, uh, generated, and uh, we should just never tire of looking at it. In case you want a baseline reference, the radius of the Earth, about whatever that is in miles, 6,371 kilometers, um, so that is a, 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 a scale on this uh, picture here. So then the Earth's gravity, if you're in a physics lecture, you're going to learn about point masses and you're going to learn about the, you know, the, what the Earth's gravity is on the surface. And if you keep uh, that lecture going, then you'll see that uh, because the Earth is flattened and the Earth is rotating, that the uh, gravitational acceleration changes with latitude through the Earth. And if you then keep adding the details in, then, you, then you'll discover that the gravitational acceleration changes everywhere. It's never the same on the Earth. And here, I'm showing you a picture, again, in terms of blues and reds, where the gravitational acceleration at the Earth is a little bit more or a little bit less than what you learn for the value in, in school. So my canonical value that we learn in Europe is 9.81. I don't know what it is in, in uh, non-metric units. So, but the blues and the reds are the tiny, tiny deviations from that value, which are nevertheless very well expressed, very well measurable. And these sorts of maps are made by tracking hundreds of orbits of thousands of satellites over time. And um, they're available in a level of detail that, again, shows you plate tectonics. It shows you the areas of the, uh, where, where uh, ocean floor is being consumed, like in Indonesia here and in the Japan and Philippine trenches. It again shows you where uh, the ocean floor is being formed. Um, it allows us to explore the inside of the Earth. At the very finest scale, it's how we find oil in the Gulf of Mexico. It's how we find minerals, because uh, the, uh, the interesting minerals are usually denser than the ones uh, that are uh, not of economic interest. It's how we find tunnels underground and keep track of people tunneling under, under the border wall. This is an exploration method that has all sorts of uh, practical applications as well. And all of that, because rocks of a different type and of a different temperature, have a different density, and so that sort of information, putting it together from gravity, is important. 
But now back to the seismology, now there will be earthquakes, okay? Here, again, the same view of the Earth. This is a map of, I've just put a dot for every earthquake in the large catalog that is available from the 19, late 70s onwards. And if you just plot their locations, again, you're seeing plate tectonics. You're seeing the active zones of earthquake activity demarcating the edges between tectonic plates. Here is the Indo-Australian plate, and then here is the you know, Philippine plate, and the North American plate, and the Eurasian plate. And where it's very black, there's a lot of earthquakes because there are boundaries between plates which are butting against each other, sliding against each other, uh, colliding with each other, subducting against and under each other. And then, of course, you have the mid-ocean ridges, again, uh, much less dense in terms of earthquakes, but again, just plotting them, you're seeing these areas where the ocean floor is being generated. Then you have the areas of active mountain building, where I'm trying to point there to, to the uh, Himalayas. And then you have the intraplate earthquakes, the odd earthquakes that here and there happen, even though they're nowhere near a plate boundary, but they're nevertheless uh, sort of scattered uh, around. Uh, uh, Alaska would be up there. Uh, obviously a very active zone with another magnitude 7 today, or yes, or was it yesterday? So how many of those are a day? Well, there are earthquakes every day. The number here that I have in mind is there are about two earthquakes a day that are of a magnitude five and a half, six and above. And any of those earthquakes, anywhere they happen on or in the Earth, is recordable by modern day seismic instrumentation anywhere on Earth. So the earthquake could be in Japan and I would pick it up in my basement in Gio Hall in Princeton, or it could come from the absolute other end of the world and its waves would be seen by our normal high quality instrumentation that we uh, uh, as a community have access to with hundreds and hundreds of seismometers uh, in, in labs around the world and in, in government uh, offices and in geological surveys. So um, back to these earthquakes, and of course they generate these waves, and a third time I'm going to try to paint a picture here that if the rocks through which those waves travel, if they're hotter, they slow down the waves. If they're denser, they, um, if they're colder, they speed them up. And so we're trying to map how fast seismic waves travel through the Earth because we want to know what the Earth is made of and what its temperature is because that is telling us about the interior structure of the mantle. So the physics variables of interest are the densities and the speed of seismic waves. That is what I want to know for the inside of the Earth. So I'll give you an example here. Um, we now know, as a community, the royal we here, you know, it's been 100 years since we've turned our attention to what seismology is all about. It's been 100 years since there are instruments. It's been about 50 years now that we have high-quality instruments, about 30 years that they've all been digitally linked up. And so we have made multiple models of the Earth to the point where if an earthquake happens anywhere in the world, we will find it, we will know it, we will talk about it in the newspaper the same day. And then we have enough models of the Earth that will allow us to predict what exactly those waves would be doing if we are about right in our modeling. So this uh, website here that my colleague maintains at Princeton is called Shake Movie. If you go and look for an earthquake of interest, they will have done computer simulations to show you what the waves generated by that earthquakes would look like when they roll around the Earth. So here I picked an earthquake that's offshore Oregon here. And here is the time, so this is one minute, and the color scale is um, a vertical component of motion, whether it's up or down, and don't worry about the units for a moment, but you're seeing the wave spread and ripple out over the uh, U.S. here. So take a look at 136 and at 232, and you're seeing a lot of complexity develop in the wave uh, field because not all waves travel at the same speed, and so if there's a little bit of speed difference, then over time that develops in a larger distance difference. And here you're seeing the, the various uh, waves traveling at different speeds rolling around the U.S. Six minutes, eight minutes, ten minutes, and so on. So all of these movies, all these simulations uh, of the global catalog of earthquakes is, is, is being put on the web, and again, that is 
you know, instructive to just look at and enjoy, but it provides us data, or rather synthetic data or model data to compare with the actually observed data to uh, 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 figure out whether or not the models that lead to these simulations are good enough, and if they're not, we are improving them. Um, you might wonder what happens if these waves, of course, you know, roll off the view of the Earth. Well, they roll around and then they come back and oftentimes they come multiply back to the point of origin where you can track the waves a number of times. So that here which I showed you is all computer generated models of what should happen if an earthquake, which really did happen in Oregon offshore, would uh, happen the way we think it did and if the earth looks the way we think it does. So this is all made up data, right? This is modeled computer simulations. So now I'll show you the real data that comes from events like you get as they are collected by IRIS here. So here, this is one of the real data. So here I'll introduce you to the uh, little animation here. Every dot now is an instrument. It's a seismic instrument. And there are hundreds, and this is just a subset of them. And the color scale is going to be, as time goes on in this movie, if the seismometer is recording an up motion, it's going to be blue, and if it's a down motion, it's going to be red, and you'll see them reflect what the waves are doing as they're passing through the array. And then one of those stations uh, is shown in, as, a, as a trace, like an actual seismogram that you might see on one of those stations, and then time will be going uh, along here. And the earthquake in question is a, is a 2007 Southern Sumatra event, so it's coming from you know, all the way on the other end of the Earth, the large earthquake, a magnitude uh, eight and a half. And so as time goes on, you're seeing these seismometers get the wave field to come in, and up is blue and blue, red is down, and, uh, or vice versa, and you're seeing the wave field. Okay, so now this is data. These are thousands and thousands of seismograms from these actual uh, uh, seismometers. So by now, we have had some of the not really damaging waves come in, and, and you're seeing down there here that the, the big surface waves are still needing to arrive. They're coming in around now. This wave field is complex and broken up, and we're just showing blue and red here. And now we're about 5,000 seconds in. And there are ripples that are bouncing up and down. And if you wait, we're going to see that one arrive. And it's coming. And there it is. And now it's going the other way because this is one of those waves that has traveled around the Earth and is on its way back now. This is a multi-orbit uh, surface wave. Okay, so once again, this is the type of data that IRIS archives. You can get every one of those seismograms tonight if you want, and you can get these very pictures and you can get the actual data. And that's the sort of information that we compare with our predictions based on our models to try and figure out where we can do better. I'll show you one more example from a, a mid-continental earthquake. This is, boom, in Nevada, and much less interesting, much smaller, and so over time now it's basically gone and we're back in the noise, and so forth. we never see the rest of that. Um, nevertheless, I think this is one of those. It's just fun to watch how all these digital seismometers are all on the internet are just telling you, hey, it's up, it's down, here are uh, waves. And then the third thing that I'm going to show is I'm going to show you, I'm going to stop it here. So this is another s simulation, which um, again, it has at the ba as its basis a model of the Earth, what we think should be going on, and then it puts in one earthquake a location at the start, and it puts three stations. And as time goes on, it shows you a cross section through the Earth. So the top is the Earth's crust. The bottom is the Earth's core, so we're looking at the Earth's mantle. And now we're seeing inside of the Earth the ups and downs of these actual waves going through. 
and you're seeing how wonderfully complex the Earth's wave field is, how much more interesting this sort of problem is. The geometry of the Earth um, with its sharp interfaces that reflect waves, like one is coming off the core here, then there are waves that are going through the core, there are waves that are hugging the core and being re-radiated up, there are waves that are uh, going first up and then bouncing off the surface, then twice off the surface, there are waves that are staying close to the surface, and so all of this complex wave field is what we're recording in these uh, seismograms here. And so any and all of that information, as you are seeing, must be sensitive to the inside of the Earth because these are waves that are literally going down there. This third thing that I showed you is again a complete simulation that is not uh, containing any data. And of course our job as scientists is to collect more data to figure out if our models are right. And I'm going to now reopen that and go back to this here. Okay, so I think I'm making the point that we have a lot of models already pretty good. We have a lot of data, and every time there is an earthquake, our community is sad for the victims, but happy for science because it brings information with which we can study the Earth and ultimately uh, know more about these uh, events. So I'm going to bring this back to a cartoon fashion and say, okay, well, we have earthquakes, we have stations, and they go through the Earth, so they carry information about what's inside. The first order things that you might again learn in a physics class, if you could you start with optics, you'll say, well, those rays, they bend. They come from a source, they go down in the earth, they are coming up, we're seeing them again. That's first order evidence that the wave speeds generally increase with depth because that gives you the refraction necessary to send them down and bring them back up. Uh, we know very, very well about the sharp interfaces in the planet. The, the places where, say, the rocky mantle turns to the liquid iron core because it's a real boundary. There are more such boundaries in the Earth. The crust mantle boundary is one of them. There's internal boundaries here. One of them I've shown here where the minerals that are making up the rock uh, due to pressure and temperature changes just change completely their crystal structure and that changes the physical properties. And once again, it's a boundary from which those waves uh, bounce back. So the fact that we see sharp reflections tells us about sharp interfaces in, in speeds inside. We know that the Earth's fluid, that the Earth's outer core is fluid because if we're tracking down waves that are going through them, some of them completely disappear because certain types of waves just don't propagate in a fluid. And then they come out the other end as a completely changed wave. And so uh, um, I think it's probably about 100 years ago now that we have known from just looking at the number of earthquake records that the Earth has, uh, has these main divisions of crust mantle core with roughly an increase of wave speed with depth, multiple sharp interfaces, a fluid core on the inside, and then again a solid inner core that I'm trying to point to here. That thing is the solid inner core which is made of, uh, it's a ball of iron uh, crystal uh, in crystalline form. So. Then I need to give you a little bit of terminology, and you know, we say earthquakes, you know, the local ones are the ones that are close by. And if it's close by, the information that we get from the Earth is shallow, because for an earthquake to be recorded nearby, the path that that ray is taking is just sampling a little bit of the local environment. Our term for an earthquake that is far away, like from here, Alaska is not even that far, is a teleseismic phase, and for a wave to be recorded far from its source, well, it tells you something about deeper structure because to connect that path here, some of that information is uh, definitely coming from uh, the Earth's mantle. And then a core phase, as the name implies, well, it has gone through the core, it's gone down there and come back up and it will deliver information f uh, from the core, but in this particular example we need to observe it much more farther away from the source. The same goes for all the diffractions and all the reflections and so on. Every one of them gives us some particular bit of, uh, of information about a particular path through the Earth. And then to uh, around the loop of science, is to marry predictions to observations to compare what we have been modeling to what we're really getting. And I'm only giving you one example here, and my slide is not rendering super well here, but the black line is a seismogram that is coming from a prediction by a model, 
and the blue line is a seismogram that's coming from an observation. So one of them is real, the other one is made up, but close enough to reality from our prior observations. And now we make a measurement. Now we are saying, okay, well, that first arrival was pretty good. In the beginning, it's maybe a little bit too fast or a little bit too slow. We'll need to adjust our model a little bit to make it faster or slower in the area that this wave goes through. Sometimes it's a little bit too big. Sometimes it's a little bit too small. Sometimes it's uh, oscillating a little bit too rapidly. Sometimes a little bit too slowly. The phasing, the frequency, the dispersions, the amplitude, all the things that you learn in physics lecture about th that are properties of, uh, of waves, well, all of these are potentially measurables for us to compare with uh, the data and to update our models to ever refine our information about the inside of the Earth. So putting all of that together, the, the grand methodology of that is called seismic tomography. And it is like X-ray medical CT tomography and also different. It's like it because the principle is there is a source of energy, an X-ray source, and it sends rays and waves through your body and it's detected on the other end and we know something about what we put in and we figure out what comes out and we compare the results and we say ah it must have gone through a higher density material a higher velocity material and so on we do the same thing with the earth from all those observations of sources and receivers we're trying to figure out the interior distribution of what sits inside the earth beyond those first order divisions i like to think that Earthquake tomography is much more interesting than X-ray tomography for the simple reason that in the medical labs, everything is controlled. They know exactly where the resource is. They put the receivers where they want, and they're taking care to not over-radiate you with, with X-ray, so there's a, a limitation there. But in principle, they can shine all around you with their X-rays and record it anywhere they want. Earthquakes, we don't make them happen, at least not the big ones. And this is part of, uh, of why I'm here. We don't have receivers everywhere. So it's like we are trying to figure out what the inside of the Earth is like from a really incomplete data set because we don't control where the earthquakes are and we only are starting to control where the receivers are that record those records. I want to skip over that. And I'm going to give you now a little quick tour of the inside of the Earth based on the general method here that I've been describing, the seismic tomography from earthquake waves using these principles of, of wave propagation, optics, and computer modeling. And that's just to illustrate here, you know, here's the continent of Australia, okay? And this map here is a, a, a wave speed map where again the blues is the waves travel faster than average, and the reds are where the waves travel slower than average. And if you want to look at this as a map of a sort of a continental keel of a boat of, of, of relatively cold rock rendered in blue that floats in a relatively hot mantle, then that is the interpretation that we're giving to it. And Another way of saying it is, well, uh, how deep of a hole do you have to drill to no longer be aware that there's a continent above you, okay? And if you want to use the boundary between the blue and the red, then somewhere in the middle of the Australia, where some of the older rocks lie, it's at least 200 miles before you're in the Earth's mantle. And then you don't really know that there's a continent above you. If you're in the east of, of Australia, here in, in Region 3, well, there's only maybe about 50 miles of a continent, and then you're in this red blob here that we interpret as, again, the Earth's mantle. Um, and so this is a first example of mapping the inside of the Earth uh, through uh, these wave speed maps. I'll give you three examples. Here's the second example. I spoke to you about uh, zones in the Earth, like here in Indonesia, where the ocean floor is being shoved down and consumed and going inside of the Earth in a process called subduction. Well, we know that because we're seeing earthquakes that are tracking you know, ever deeper depths as we go underneath those uh, ocean trenches, but we're also seeing that using seismic tomography. So I'll show you this uh, cross-section seven here, where again, on a scale of blue is faster than average, and so uh, uh, by interpretation, cold and dense and wants to sink. And red is slower than average, and by interpretation is the stuff that wants to stay at the top. And you're seeing here from uh, south to north, 
that this, this line here is tracking an area of blue material that we call a subduction, subducted slab that is part of the large-scale convective circulation system of the mantle where plate tectonics moves the plates around and when they meet, one of them is going to go down the other if it can, and that's one of those examples. Then, of course, in the Himalayas, the, the, there is all sorts of interesting things going down because it's where a continental plate, plate meets another continental plate, and there is a, a tug of war over which one should be going down, and the result is both of them kind of want to stay on top, and therefore you get a large mountain being built, which is the, uh, uh, the collision zone that is the uh, Himalayan mountain belt. And then finally, I want to return to these mantle plumes because they have been the hardest to image. And we have hints that the places like Tahiti and Hawaii are zones where material is coming up, but we do not have enough detail about it, but we are trying hard to get it. So here's a third type of a map here, and that is uh, a rendering of the Earth, and again the wave speeds, and again the same color scale of blue and red, and it's at 400 kilometers depth, so about 300 miles down, 250 miles down. And it's centered here on that big red blob that I'm trying to point at with the point. Yeah, there it is. And so this is an area called a Pacific, the Pacific Zone or the Pacific Superplume. All of that stuff is red, and if you remember one of the first cross sections, there was that root, that base of that big blob of cartoonish material that was coming up, which is the material that we think is feeding all these volcanoes. So um, Galapagos is on there. Well, it also appears to be over a red blob. Even Yellowstone, uh, that requires more detail than I have now. Uh, Hawaii, all of these mantle plumes, all of these, well, all of these uh, surface expressions of volcanisms, volcanism, we are trying to connect to their depth expression of where that material is coming from. But this is a very large map. This is in the entire Earth. Here's Australia. If you haven't found it yet, there again is that, that uh, we knew that Australia was blue. It was faster than average. Even at 400 kilometers depth, there's still a hint of that. Um, so here's Australia. Here is uh, Alaska, right? If you don't lose the, the US here. Um, so this is a large-scale map. These are variations over hundreds and hundreds of miles, and we really need to know more detail if we want to be able to say something uh, much more detailed. I'll show you that same model. Uh, sorry, I'll show you a different model in cross-section. Here, focused again. This is Samoa. That's Tahiti, the top right, panel B here. And those are the Marquesas Island. And here again, we're on the Coromantle boundary there. And it's slow material that wants to rise. And now we're seeing that it's broken up in pieces, and each of them may be feeding one of these uh, particular island provinces of volcanoes, but we're also seeing that it's all a little bit fuzzy, and we really need to get a lot more information to be able to quantitatively model what comes out of the depths of the Earth. So um, uh, I'll say it again. We don't control earthquakes. They're on plate boundaries mostly, and uh, they're never enough for our purpose to do this process well. And second, we don't have enough stations, okay? Most of the Earth's seismic stations, all those hundreds of ones that Iris so admirably, you know, uh, archives for us and puts, makes available on the internet, if we plot a subsection here of the large, good quality stations and I give them a little cone of light to show sort of their ray of, their zone of, uh, of influence, then well, it's not a surprise that in all of the world's oceans, there are blind spots for the data because there is just no instruments that are going down to the bottom of the ocean. Yes, they do exist, but they're not very many. They are expensive. They are hard to put there. People do do that, and they are doing it very well, but ultimately it's a small dent in the lack of data that we have for the ocean floor. So... At this point, this is where my signs really did begin when we looked at the oceanographic community and we learned about the project over a decade ago where thousands of independent autonomous robotic floats are around in the world's oceans and measuring the ocean temperature at a variety of depths and the ocean salinity. 
all of that information we need to be able to monitor and to measure and to model ocean currents and to keep track of the heat content in the ocean, to keep track of what the temperature of the Earth is doing and so on. But we just were interested in the principle of sending an autonomous device out in the ocean and record information. And so here's another example, 4,000, the numbers go up and down, they're being replenished. And so our question was, well, can we just get some sort of a robotic device to act like one of those high quality seismometers that we have on land and collect data for us that we can use to refine our image of the inside of the earth and answer some of those questions of what are the details of the Tahitian, Tahitian super plume, how deep does the Hawaiian plume go, what is going on with Iceland, uh, uh, and so on. And so these were the Obama years. So our question was, you know, can we build anything resembling that, that oceanic array? And so, you know, we can, we can try, okay? That was in our uh, optimism here. And so uh, the acronym made by my uh, collaborator, Hus Nolet, uh, that he invented was called MERMAID for Mobile Earthquake Recording in Marine Areas by Independent Divers. And this is where the autonomous robotic floats are starting, okay? Um, I'm uh, going to skip over the history of this idea. For those of you that are interested, these, you can find these things on, on the web. Like all good ideas, they have a long history and somebody thought of it before the first person thought about it and you find somebody who had an even earlier idea. But I'm gonna skip the early history of that to arrive at our own first prototype. So what we did is we went to the oceanographers and we said, give us one of those devices. Well, we said, please, can we buy one? And so we bought one, okay. And here is a shot of the inside. So this is a mermaid, well, sorry, this is an Argo float or a solo float, which we turned into what we called the mermaid float by giving it a microphone that records the pressure variations in the water. It's called the hydrophone that will act like a little seismometer and give us those earthquake waves with which we can image the inside of the earth. Um, that's the, the, the skeleton of it, which is, is basically a pump that pumps a hydraulic fluid around and therefore slightly, ever so slightly, adjusts its volume and thus its density and thus its buoyancy. And so it is able to go down to great depth, a few kilometers, and then come up at will and it controls itself. So we then gave it one of those hydrophones, one of those microphones, if you will, and this was our very first uh, mermaid prototype here offshore um, La Jolla in California. So we put it out and we waited hoping to record an earthquake, okay? The idea of sending these things on a mission is as follows. We're out there, California, it's going down. We program it to go down to a certain depth. In our case, this is about a mile down. And there it just sits and it listens and it records everything that's going on at depth in the ocean, which is a lot of noise. There are animals that live in the oceans. There are ships that uh, go into the oceans. There is ice crackling in the oceans. There are earthquakes on the ocean floor. Remember those mid-ocean ridge earthquakes that are ultimately local little things that we're not that interested in. And then there are those distant teleseismic earthquakes that help us figure out what's going on with the inside of the earth. So while it sits uh, uh, at this depth and it records everything, we also program it to recognize what the really is an earthquake. That's a lot of the research was in making the device smart enough to know what a good earthquake is. And if it finds a good earthquake, it will come up uh, and tell us about that earthquake by sending us the data over satellite. And then we send it the message back that says, usually go right back down and continue your mission and then it waits and finds another earthquake and then it comes and tells us about it and so on. So that's the diagram of a mission. At the surface, get an instruction, go down, uh, process all the data, detect earthquakes and when they're good, come tell us about it. So I don't know if it seems easy but it wasn't easy and it took us a while and after a bunch of trials, we finally have this one earthquake. Okay, this is now from 2004, I think. And so for a long time, I walked around as the seismologist that had recorded one earthquake, okay? 
trying to convince others that we really should take to the ocean. We had a very small grant to put that uh, instrument out to basically buy that thing and put it out. Um, and all we got was this one earthquake. Here's the record of it, still proud of it. So this is in seconds and zero is where we expected the signal to arrive because remember we have other hundreds other land-based stations that told us about this earthquake that this was when the arrival of the wave should be and if you know there it is this was the the the, the signal to noise here the signal becomes dominant there is still noise there are still reverberations and so on but right at this zero point is where we expected it and the wave is indeed arriving this was a magnitude 5.9 at about 5,000 kilometers about a uh, 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 an eighth of the, of the circumference of the Earth um, away. And so we had done it. We had found this one earthquake that sampled the Earth's mantle. So I'm also going to uh, skip it in the interest of time here, but there was a lot going on on the inside of this earthquake, uh, of this instrument, because a lot going on on the inside of the oceans. There are people doing stuff, there are animals doing stuff, and we look at that very, very carefully because we only have this instrument needing to decide that it's when it's a good earthquake to tell us that. And so uh, ships, air gun campaigns, non-primary earthquake phases, whales of various descriptions, all of those things have very telltale structures and we taught our, our uh, recognition algorithms to discriminate them. For those of you who are interested, but I won't show you the details, the first column is all the time domain things. It's basically the pressure variations in the water. The middle panels is the time's varying spectral density, which tells us where the energy is, at which wavelengths, at which frequency of oscillation. And the thing on the right is a thing called a, a scalogram based on a transform called the wavelet transform that effectively to us became sort of a barcode by which we could identify the type of, of, of records. Whether it's a whale and we weren't interested, or whether it was a ship and we could get rid of it, whether it was a small earthquake that was too local to be of deep interest, or finally whether it was one of those very special ones that we want many, many of. And then became, this was then the start of saying, okay, we have done it, we have one earthquake, we have an algorithm to do, we can in principle do it, can somebody please give us money to do it? So as when you're in science, you then need to start begging to people, and then you also need to get used to uh, being said no to, because then people say, oh, it will never work, and then you say, but I have this one, and say, well, that was a lucky one, and so on. So lucky for me, or unlucky for me, none of my grants were funded, but lucky for me, my collaborator, Chris Nolet, moved to Europe, and he is older, and he can write better grants, and the European research community gave him a whole bunch of money to, to essentially fund five years of development to turn this prototype into something that was actually practical and doable. So that was European money to Chris Nolet, and I was left all alone on the eastern shore of uh, New Jersey. And I teamed up with a, a colleague in uh, Rhode Island, Bud Vincent, and we said, you know, we need to like get something going here so we can collaborate. And so we wrote grant upon grant that was rejected. In the end, we got this much money, okay. Um, <laughs> and it, it is to scale. I took the trouble of scaling it by area, okay. So that's what your taxpayer dollars did for our project. This was a good old $48,000. And this was the $4 million that uh, uh, went into Europe. But never mind, it led to the development of a new technology. It led to our second prototype, and we continued to work together very productively. And so that was Mermaid 2. Okay, so now we were in the, not in the big league, but we're like, we had one prototype, we're going to build a bunch more, and we're going to do a trial experiment to go any plume, let's any uh, volcanic island, let's go find one and, and try if we can carry that sort of thing to the end. So, uh, um, the mermaid grew, it became longer, it got more batteries, it was slightly longer lived. This one lived for two years, each of them. It also changed colors, as you see. But ultimately, it's just, here is that little hydrophone, that little microphone. Here's the antenna peeping out here, coming up. And a number of experiments were done with this in a variety of oceans. So we wanted to go from this one earthquake to a whole collection. Okay, this is it in uh, the bay, in the Mediterranean. 
So here's a collection of these records by that second generation mermaid. They're not quite perfect one, but they're a really good start with European money. The first two panels are a variety of earthquake waves that have gone through the Earth. Some of these mantle waves, some of these core waves, some of these bouncy waves. They're labeled here P. If you're a seismologist, you'll recognize the phase P. P, P, I can't see my own pointer here. I'm reading it off the top P, and P, K, P goes to the core. P, P is bouncing at the surface. Um, that those, so th those are the main ones. And then the uh, column on the right is a whole collection, a subset of which is shown here, of hundreds and hundreds earthquake of earthquakes that came from a region where they were not recorded by any other instrument. A little swarm in the middle of the Indian Ocean that just kept sending us earthquakes that you're seeing here in column C here. Local phases that are not helping us image the inside of the Earth, but are telling us something about the activity of the ocean floor, which itself generates earthquakes. Um, this is one of those things is the side benefit of that is that hundreds of earthquakes, unbeknownst to any other instruments, are helping us figure out the details of the tectonic plates going on in the, uh, uh, under the Indian Ocean in this case, um, but which nevertheless weren't our main uh, target. Our main target became uh, the Galapagos, and I'm going to, this paper is coming out this week or next, and it's a preliminary, uh, it's a final analysis of that data set, which uh, lasted for two years and returned a whole number of earthquakes, but ultimately I'm going to uh, only show you a few slides of it, first of all, because the paper has not come out yet, but it's coming out very soon. And second of all, because it shows you the limitations and why we went to phase three, okay? Um, here is the uh, result. So now, this again is a cross section of the Earth. Core to, uh, so the core mantle boundary is here, the Earth's crust is here, and it's centered on Galapagos. And now you have the filter developed in your eyes that you want to start looking at, see how many of these uh, red things are lining up and potentially are delineating that mantle plume. And so I'll just point out to this one here, and so this is the, uh, the object of further study. Our, our images here, which are the final ones obtained with this uh, not uh, ultimately giant experiment, are showing some of the emerging details of the structure underneath the Galapagos. And here this is a slightly differently oriented cross-section, which are seeing, well, there's still a lot of complexity and a lot of lack of detail that we'd rather fill in. And that is what motivate, motivated us to, to really move the Mermaid 2 into the third phase, where we would have more of them, they would live longer, and they would be just reflecting the march of science and engineering and become better and better. So that's where I would like to end and talk to you about our, our uh, uh, current phase that we're in, which is really our most exciting phase. The third instrument it not only changed color, it only changed shape. It became a glass sphere that now can go to much greater depth. It now lasts, it, it has a lifetime of about five years because it's filled with batteries. Here it is being tested in the, in the tank of this company, Océan, that makes it. This design is the brainchild of a French engineer called Jan Hello, and him and his uh, uh, friends and collaborators at this other uh, outfit, uh, which is a private company, uh, are now building these things for us to our design specifications and in a collaborative mode. Here is the inside uh, with the lithium batteries that are inside. And of course, the interesting bits are on a chip that is of no interest to show to you because it's just a little uh, computer board. That's where all the processing goes on. That's where all the analysis and discrimination goes on. And with this, we uh, uh, managed to acquire 18 instruments and put them out where around Tahiti, which is where, where I want to end, and where they are currently. So how does such an ocean deployment take place? Well, it's hard, okay? First of all, you have to make the instruments and then ship them. Here they are getting ready in the, uh, uh, on the parking lot of the geophysical lab that they have there in, in Papete, where the people helped us a lot getting them ready. Their little antennas are peeking out because we uh, transport them on deck of our ship. This is it. This inside of here is a glass sphere 
with all those batteries, the electronics, and the pumping mechanism. This black thing is a bladder that inflates and deflates and adjusts the buoyancy by which it can go up and come down. The gray thing is, again, the antenna, and you don't really see it very well, but there's a little black knob. I'm not sure where it is now. That is the actual instrument, which is that little microphone for the water. That's the hydrophone. There it is. That's the, that's the actual instrument. All the rest is a truck, is a vessel, is a robot for ocean exploration. And that is another message I want to make here. We, are, we have built this, this device that can do all sorts of things, and that's all it needs to carry really for us. But for other sciences, for people interested in those whales, or for people interested again in the temperature of the ocean, or the pressure variations and salinity variations with pressure, or for oxygenation, or the phosphorescence, or for the algal counts, or any other instrument, ultimately, we as a seismological community can now take for others interested in other aspects of the ocean. But uh, I do need to tell you about my horrible, horrible trip aboard this fantastic vessel with excellent crew and a fantastic kitchen staff. But it, um, it is just not, ultimately, it wasn't a whole lot of fun being on this 28-meter this, uh, this ship. What is that, about 80 feet uh, of length? It's just small, and it rocks, and it's loud, and it's, it's noisy. But one has to suffer for science. I do want to give you this message. So I spent 21 days on that. Uh, very interesting experience. Didn't feel good a single day of this experience. I, most of the time was lying in my coffin-like uh, uh, cabin. But I'm so impressed with all the people running the ship because you're in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of nowhere. I didn't see a bird in 21 days. I didn't see another ship in 21 days. And you're completely at the mercy of this phenomenal, capable crew who not only cooks and cleans and helps you with the science, um, but also fixes everything that, 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 that they were building the engine as it was running 24-7 for a whole month. And there's always something breaking. And so they, they could do plumbing and they could do soldering and hammering and electric, you know. So much activity, all crammed on that deck. Um, so we started with 11 on deck. That was the whole width of it. This is the best shot I could take of it. Uh, a very wet deck, a very low deck. You know, if it rolls around, the ocean is washing away at your feet. But then, you know, every couple of hundred kilometers, we, we deployed one of these instruments, and that's where they are currently. And so, of course, our deck space improved a little bit as, as they went uh, into the ocean. And so, yeah, that's as close as we got to Moria. We saw it. Um, we also got some fuel in the Marquesas Island, but I wasn't allowed to get out. Um, and so the rest of it was doing this at night sometimes in the middle of the day. It didn't matter when we had it. We were going to our particular points. And by the way, that's not me. That appears on your web page. That's somebody else. Um, um, and we lift it, and we let it go. And that's where they're at. And so now, where I want to leave you is that, this is a night deployment, I want to leave you with this fact here that we are building on a shoestring, because once again, all my grant applications are shot down so far until I'm going to get that lucky break. So with undergraduates, um, we're building this web uh, uh, um, uh, page here, Earthscope Oceans. This is our overarching uh, organization now where we are telling people where the instruments are, what the data are, and we're starting to give away the data before anyone is even uh, asked for it. So if you go there today, you'll see a little map, and you'll see, well, again, there was Tahiti. These were the 11 that I put out. Uh, these um, uh, seven, are they, were put out by Jan Hello, and so you go there today, you go there tomorrow, you will see where they have been and where they're at. And if you start following them, you'll learn something about the ocean floor. And as our website improves, which right now is, is uh, a, a work in progress, you will start seeing the seismograms coming up and you will be able to get your um, a, a look at the data as fresh as they come in. And this is where I want to leave you. This is an ongoing experiment. We went from a prototype with one earthquake to a successful but limited and too small but nevertheless successful look at the plumbing underneath Galapagos to a third phase where we're going to a much larger area. 
these are the only the first 18 of the instruments. We've managed to get a Chinese university uh, interested, and they are interested in big science, and so they're going to um, um, uh, um, very soon deploy 24 more and then add more. This is Shenzhen, the Southern University of Science and Technology, that is going to um, uh, add a whole bunch of instruments. And so pretty soon we'll be having 40 to 50 such instruments in the ocean, and that's where we really want to keep growing from because ultimately we should like to get a few hundreds of them so we can image the whole mantle in increasing detail and not just leave it at this point of uh, first interest, which was the great Pacific uh, superfluid. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your time and open it up for questions if you have the patience. I have the patience. Anybody have any questions? I'm going to start here and just going to pass it back to you. Uh, it's interesting to see that you picked a pattern there of spreading them out. Yeah. Uh, are you picking the closer currents to spread them out? They are. They are spreading them out as, as we, uh, uh, if the question is why did we pick this pattern, it was a pattern of convenience because we got the ship for free because remember, no money. And so the ship had to you know, go from one place to the next and we're like, okay, how about a loop? We were able to do that and that, that line that came is because it had to go from one place to the next. And we want them to go places because we want to have the receivers go from one place to the next because over time that improves that coverage. It helps us, it's like the x-ray uh, source that rotates around the patients, we want the receivers to rotate. Ultimately, the, they will end up wherever they are, and, and, and if they, we predict a five-year lifetime based on their number of surfacings that they can do, so who knows where they end up. If you look on the website today, these are pictures from a few weeks ago, you will see they have already drifted and we'll show you the tracks that they're having. So if you're interested in ocean currents at depth, you can take these as every one of them being an example of a surfacing roughly on the order of every week or so, and you will see what those currents are indeed doing. So that's other data, which is current data that we're getting whether we want it or not. They're, yeah, so they're going up and down to a depth that we set and control, not necessarily the bottom of the ocean. Uh, where they can stably cruise. Uh, we cannot control where they go. We can only control their depth. And so when they're at the surface, they take time from the GPS, they resynchronize their clock because otherwise we can't really tell time very well and we need that for speed. Um, and they communicate their data to any earthquakes recorded to Iridium, the satellite provider, and then it comes via, well, it comes into our mailbox essentially. Um, but we have no control over where they're going because they're completely passively drifting and any system to control them would just consume too much energy and we don't want to expend that. We're uh, at five years, we're expecting 250 surfacings, each with about three or four earthquakes and so that's the primary reason for this instrument now until, and this is starting to be the point, we're inviting other communities in biology or physical oceanography to give us an instrument that will also carry for them and uh, communicate their data. So it sounds like for instance what you're saying is that yeah, you're already working with, I mean, it seems like objects like biologists and oceanographers, this is something that can be used broader than that. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, the, our initial approach is our metadata, which is where the instrument is, is of, if, of interest to oceanography, we're just giving that away. Our seismic data, well, those are going to be the seismograms. That's, that's staying in this iris community, which ultimately is giving that away, too. Um, what the, um, uh, the physical oceanography community is very well set because, remember, they have these three to 4,000 instruments already there. And we are uh, hoping to get most out of the biological community, the biochemical community, and so on. And so the, the Mermaid 4 which is around the corner, is going to have seven open channels for somebody else's instrument that it will also handle and, and send the data for. So seismology is the hardest application because we, we sample at 40 hertz and we 
calculate all the time whether this might have been an earthquake. And so that is very energy, it consumes energy. Whereas some biologist might only want to count uh, whales one hour per day, or a chemical oceanographer might only take 10 samples per hour or something like that. And so we're working, I'm part of, part of me being here is to talk to communities at large to say, if you have ideas for instrument, if you can make it small enough and then we will work with you to help you carry it on this instrument. That's ongoing and growing. How much money do you have? <laughs> okay, so how, much, how many would I like to have? So Galapagos, that mermaid too, we had about 14 that lived about two years. It got us good result, but we really want to double it. So in Tahiti, we're in the, in, on the order of 40 to 50, and they're going to live about five years. If you're asking me what would be a reasonable number to get good information about the whole rest of the Earth, then I think we should talk about 300 instruments everywhere. And that's not that many compared to 3,000 ones that the physical oceanographers are having, and not compared with the thousands of stations that are on land, but it's way more than we have now. The Chinese institution that is leading this effort now, uh, uh, they are confident that they can probably get 150 in the water between now and a few years from now. And if they do, they will really just have redefined uh, seismology for all of us. So I would like to give the thanks Iris and the Hashtag Fair. Also like to thank Dr. Simon for making time on his schedule to come cross country. And earlier tonight I asked him a question. So I asked for you to Iris, do you get to say no? And he said, yes, I do get to say no to the fact that we could port the next one out of that ten or eleven foot because Iris is always answering that no, it's not that you get a chance to get here. I'm appreciative of you making time on your schedule to make it out here. Uh, if you didn't find any out there, uh, please take a minute on your way out to do so. If you want some more time this weekend, please show up same place tomorrow at 10 p.m. Uh, for an Oregon connection for satellites and the first satellite transmission of the official Oregon. And for the geology lecture, take a few at the end of Dan and Jim, who still has to take places. I'd be glad for you to hold them for a little bit and take them. If you are in my class and you're here for denial, but also to benefit of a couple points, instead of writing something, if you come visit me, I will mark your name off. Even though you already signed in on the sheet, then you don't have to write a couple or uh, pay them. And so the other thanks I'd like to give We've got one additional sponsor this year, Vanille, and I'd also like to thank the college, and especially the IT staff that live streams these events. So thanks to Andrew and Theo and Ben for your help today. And thank all of you for coming out on what was a nice day, a not nice day, a nice day, a <laughs> little bit of rain, I think, during the middle of the talk, and hopefully it'll just clear out now. I know a couple of you had some additional questions, and I'm sure that Trevor could be glad to meet you out in the lobby for a, a little bit and answer those questions. So thank you all for participating this evening. Thank you. As a few in my class, sneak down here and I'll